to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, Kimberly Merlitti, the virtual CFO, is back with me on the show. Kimberly has been on the show two times before. First, it was episode 361, where she shared the importance of having a CFO for your design business. And then again, episode 442, she walked us through why it's important to know your cash on hand number. And she taught us how to do that too, okay? Today, I want to also let you know that Kim is one of the co-authors in the third book coming out this November. That's right. A Well-Designed Business, The Power Talk Friday Experts, Volume 2. So if you don't have Volume 1 yet, you need to head over to luannnigara.com forward slash book two. Now today, Kim is going to share why and how you should prepare an estimate for your design projects before you sign the contract. All right. I'm sure you just went, huh? (laughs) Okay. So, but before we get started... I want to thank Monogram for sponsoring the show. Have you signed up for their design trade program yet? By joining the design trade program at Monogram, you get all the benefits of being a valued Monogram partner. You get information, education, and access to the luxury appliance that your clients want now. Because isn't everybody and their brother renovating or building a new kitchen because they're all home 24-7 eating all the meals at home, right? Be the expert. Be the one that your clients look to for the latest technology in kitchen appliances, from refrigerators to cooktops to wine fridges. Don't forget the wine fridge, okay? (laughs) Now, go to monogram.com forward slash Luann. All right, now. I realize, and Kim does too, that there are plenty of you out there who are already shaking your head saying, "Uh uh-uh, no way, Luann. I could not possibly present budgets before I sign the client. I don't have that kind of time. This won't work for me. So here's the thing. Kimberly knows numbers, right? So let's just listen up because she has 20 years of experience working in accounting. She's not coming into this blind and she's not here to tell you something crazy and then not teach you how to do it. All right. So she's going to walk you through not only why preparing an estimate at the very beginning is important, but also how to do it the right way and how to stay on track and how to rely on data so that you're not playing a guessing game and risk losing money in your business. Okay. So just listen with an open mind. If you're resistant at first, I think that you will be able to see how this could really translate to more profitability in your business. All right. So let's hear what Kim has to say about estimates for your design projects. Hi, Kim. Thanks so much for coming back to a well-designed business today. Hi there. Thanks for having me. So, of course, I'm going to have you one of my (laughs) co-authors in book three coming out this fall. I can't wait. Yay. I I was going to tell my English teacher that gave me C's, uh, but I don't think she's still alive. So... (laughs) Well, I've read your chapter. I think it's an A plus, so we don't have to worry about it. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So one of the things that I thought we would talk about, Kim, is in your chapter, you actually talk about this as well. Of course, there's uh, what I'm a firm believer of. We need to hear information many different times, many different ways in order for us to have that possibility of that aha, that breakthrough moment. And the topic that you cover in the chapter and what we're going to talk about today is about estimating a design project before you present the contract. And I know 
Kim, because you and I have talked a lot. I know in your practice, when you work with interior designers, you know, you run into a lot of resistance with designers doing this. And they, you've said to me that they've said things like, I don't have time and I can't blah, blah, blah. And I know with the designers that I work with, not that for one second, I'm going to teach them how to do this. Okay. I send them right to you for that. But <laughs> I know that part of the resistance is really a lack of understanding on how to actually do it. Uh, and so let's talk about that a little bit, Kim. What, what do you, how do you teach interior designers how they can estimate a project and why do you want them to estimate a project before they present the proposal or the contract? Walk us through it. Well, there's a laundry list of reasons, but I'll keep it short because this is only an hour show. <laughs> um, uh, so first of all, I started, I learned how to do estimating, believe it or not, when I worked for Swinerton Builders um, a long time ago. Um, I actually would jump into the finance trailer just to hang out with them to feel like I was a finance accounting person, believe it or not. <laughs> and they're the ones that taught me. They said, you need two variables. You need time and you need, you need to know the schedule, which is what time means. And then you need to know the scope of the project. Um, and so when I bring this up with my clients, especially my new ones, so shout out to all my new clients. Um, I know you're working hard, but this is something you definitely need to take on. And I've sent, I probably have 10 different versions of estimates. Um, I cater the estimates based off my client's understanding of what I'm saying. Does that make sense? So if you're giving someone a document like an Excel spreadsheet and you're saying, hey, figure it out, you're not, I'm not doing my job. So it's really important as a virtual CFO to walk them through the process. Everyone is going to learn differently. So I, like you said, you have to hear something over and over again sometimes before it sinks in. So if you, the end user, if you guys are not understanding how to do an estimate, you need to make it something you can understand. And they do that by walking it through with me. So again, you need a variable for time, when it should be completed, and the scope of the project. And depending on how you're billing, I hear the excuse, but I bill lump sum, so I don't need to do this. Well, actually, you're the number one person. If you bill lump sum, you need to do this because you need to estimate at the beginning of the project how long you think it'll take throughout the project. Now, by no means are we handing this over to the client. We might give the client, like, I think it's a range of 20 to 40 hours for the master bedroom. You can do something like that. But this is for your purposes only. Um, That's a common misconception. They think they have to hand it over to the client, and they do not. So that, I just gave you a bunch of, so I'm going to pause for a question, Luann, because I know you love questions. (laughs) I actually love you because I know you love questions. So I'm going to pause right there and make sure we're okay, and then I'm going to keep going because I I swear I could go forever. Well, I love that you give me the space to pop in and clarify (laughs) and ask my questions, Kim. Okay. So basically, we have covered this before, and we know it. I'm going to repeat it, is Mm -hmm. that whether we are billing flat fee or hourly, we still are coming up with our data based on our personal time tracking, based on previous projects, based on facts. And so what you're saying is that you want a designer to really understand when you're doing whatever the scope is, whether you're designing a master bedroom, you're designing a kitchen, to be able to go back and review past projects and say, you know what, this will be approximately 20 to 40 hours. You're not saying then go forward to the client and say approximately 24. You're saying we're building our budget now, right? This is exactly what you're saying. We're building our estimate. So you're saying, okay, in column for master bedroom, 20 to 40. So I have a question for you in that beyond what I just summarized is if I'm doing a whole house and I've got the master bedroom, I've got the kitchen, I've got this. And you mentioned a range of 20 to 40 on the master bedroom hours. By the time I add up 10 or 12 spaces, that range, especially if I'm at 200 an hour is really going to affect that estimate. So were you just saying it off the cuff or are you saying, no, start there for the estimating purposes. And then I'm going to tell you how we get that a little bit closer to an actual number. Okay. So I love all these questions and I never talk off the cuff, believe it or not, because <laughs> okay. accountants can't do that. Okay. Um, 
So, <laughs> so it's very specific to the scope of work because that's the other variables. So are we talking about, and I'm going to give you a range of different projects here because this is just not a cookie cutter answer. Right. You, let's say you've got a chateau that's 15,000 square feet. And if one of my uh, clients is listening right now, I have clients through the nation. She, uh, they know who they are. This house was huge. So we had to do this room to room to room. Not only that, we had to break out the design estimate from the purchasing and install estimate. So we had to look at the hours for both. And then on top of that, we had to make a list of furniture the client wanted in that room. Now that is a huge home and that doesn't include the outdoor furniture. So it took us probably three revisions to get that estimate right. And yeah, why are we going to all this trouble when we're not even handing this over to the client and that we're billing the client this particular one hourly? Um, it's to, so we make sure we're not missing anything in the scope. We, as the designer, and I'm not a designer, but the designer, you guys are the professional. It's your job to educate your client when they hire a designer, what it takes. I mean, if they didn't want a detailed like description of what you're going to do, they might as well just go to Ikea or Crate and Barrel on their own. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's for, act like professionals, go to them and say, this is what's going into each room. And if no matter how you're billing, at least the client has a good idea. But you are basically, I call it like boning up and setting for a test that your test is going to explain the project to your client. You have to know that inside and out. And the better you onboard your client at the beginning, the easier it's going to get to bill these huge time billings or lump sums that are big every single month. They're going to be like, oh, I remember the designer told me about this. And they will know, oh, this is when we do this room and this is how long it takes because we're custom making a, a sofa to go in this weird corner because we live in a hundred year old house. Does that make sense? It does. And I love what so you said in there yeah, that you said yeah. it's like boning up for a test. We get yeah. that. We all remember those days when we we really you, you have, you know, a four hour test. You have to sit down and for weeks and days, whatever it is, hours ahead of time, you have to prepare. And so what you're saying is that the less professional, the unprofessional approach is to just wing it and say 15,000 square foot house probably will have, you know, 20,000 in design fees, probably in 10,000 in purchasing and estimate fees, probably in 10,000 in install, probably 5,800, you know, $50,000 in outdoor furniture and 200,000 in probably. And what you're saying is no, Sit down. If it takes you two hours, four hours, six hours, sit down and really figure it out. Because I hear this as the consumer, I want to know up front what I'm getting into. Now, I understand there might be changes along the way. Mm -hmm. I understand that you're at your will as a professional to come to me partway through and say, hey, we allowed, we're allotted, we have forecasted this much in this space, but I'd like to present this. I then am making an informed decision. I'm saying, oh, my overall budget for this project was 500K. Um, and now she wants to spend another 20K on something. Yeah, I can do that. But if I don't have any idea what it was and you want another 20K, my brain wants to go into a spin cycle, right? <laughs> yeah, you, the, you can tell when your client gets overwhelmed. We all know that look. It's like they start to shift their eyes and fidget and they're like getting really uncomfortable. Come on, we all know it. I mean, right. I've been reading books on, on interrogation techniques, believe it or not, not to interrogate my client, but <laughs> I have a, I have a background in police account. You know, I did the police work for two years. So I just find it interesting that, you know, when your client's getting uncomfortable and it's actually my job to make my clients, my designers comfortable with this. So right. when they're getting uncomfortable, I know. Right. But we need to be able to hold the client's hand and explain it to them what they're getting and set them at ease. And if they start to fidget before they've even signed the contract, we need to get to the bottom of that fidgeting before they sign the contract because that could be a problem down the line. Right. We need to, basically it's a new boyfriend or girlfriend and you're trying to communicate with them what's going on. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. and the different components you're talking about is the design estimate, which is the design fees. The, uh -huh purchasing fee estimate because you are an advocate of people to bill for purchase.
purchasing time. Uh -huh. The uh -huh. installation yeah. estimate, which is the same thing, hours for the reveal install, because, you know, of course, for a 15,000 square foot home, that might that's probably not a one or a two day install. That's probably a week or two week install, mm -hmm. right? So we right. have to count for those hours for yourself, your team, the indoor furniture estimate, the outdoor furniture estimate. And I'm assuming in furniture, you're lumping in lighting and, and carpeting and everything. It's all the, the stuff that you bring in. Mm -hmm. And everything. so, so mm -hmm. what do you find when a designer is, look, I, here's what I'm thinking is if I'm newer in business, if I'm one of my baby designers and maybe the project I'm looking at is a single master bedroom that we're really, maybe we're going to do very minimal to it. We're going to do furniture. We're going to do window treatments. We're going to do an area rug and some accessories and bedding, right? So mm -hmm. I could see as a baby designer, maybe we're saying, well, what's the point of doing this exercise for, you know, a $6,000 project, right? But the point is if it's don't, almost like anything else, if we don't flex the muscle and we don't build the process for estimating all of these features, even if they, the whole thing adds up to 6,000, when the whole thing adds up to a half a million or a million, we don't have the process in place, correct? Yeah. And actually, I'm glad you brought up the smaller projects because that's the other spectrum, other side of the spectrum. When I know that some people listening to this will say, well, I don't do 15,000 square foot mansions. Well, um, for those that just do a like, I always call it a la carte for some reason. But if you're doing a bedroom and then you're, they're like, oh, I love the bedroom. Let's do the living room. You still want to do an estimate, even if the hours are so little. But what you, you're going, your brain is going through the process right. of, I'm doing a living room. Well, what did I run into last time with that other project? I remember that really made the client mad. Well, I need to make sure to work hours in for this. And we need to do this. And you guys on the whole topic of pandemic, we have to talk about personal protection equipment. Do you have personal protection equipment? That takes longer. You know, do you have extra costs because you had to get additional insurance to cover your, your staff on a job site? What if your client comes back and says, I got COVID from you, you got to protect yourself. So there's things now with what we're going through as a, a country and, a, a, you know, in the world that we need to add to our frame of, you know, our estimate. And if we need to go purchase things like that, that's additional cost. Like everything is kind of evolving right now, but it's, you need to think through the processes, every project, nothing is like, nothing is the same as your last project. And it dry, when I get new clients and they're like, well, I read in a magazine that I was just supposed to take my fees and take 10% of the construction budget. And that would be my budget. And I, I literally, put my hand on my head and I'm actually on camera with my clients on zoom when they see me do this <laughs> and every single client, I tell them at the beginning, I'm pretty blunt. This is the way it is. This is how I roll. And if it doesn't work for everybody, but then I put my hand on my head and I'm like, no, we don't do that here. <laughs> okay. Okay. We, we have to think through every project. Like it's brand, it's a brand new project. You so know, and, how yeah. do you recommend, because we have had designers, um, give us this as a, as a starting off point. So I can recall Sarah Magnus was on the show and she is a high end luxury designer. And I know we use this word a lot, but there is a difference when somebody is truly at the top, top level of the, in the interior design world. And she did mention that there was a percentage of, I'm going to call it um, the build budget, but I'd have to go back to my notes to find out, to recall what it was. But the point was that there is a guesstimate there. So what is your, I hear you're saying, no, we don't do it that way, but what is it and how do you teach your clients to do it then? Or is it, look, you know, at her stage and her level, she's recorded it and figured it out so many times that that statement is born out of data as opposed to just an offhand statement that I took from someone else as a recommendation. Okay. So I love how you brought up a high end designer that's been, that's seasoned and experienced because I bet you a hundred percent, they still go through some kind of estimation process, right, right, right. you know, so without knowing her process, but um, just by definition, an estimate is a guesstimate. It is, it's all guessing. That's, what an estimate is, but we're making the best guess we can with the data we have on file. 
you mentioned yourself, she goes and she's done this so many times. She's it's she's made such good records of these past projects. She's so seasoned that she can say, I've done five projects similar to this one. And that's how I'm going to start estimating my fees. And then she, I bet you anything she goes back through and tweaks it a little bit. Right, I right, bet right, you right. that's Understood. exactly she's only able to do that because she's so good at tracking her time and probably taking really good notes. Right. And that's a that is literally exactly what I want everybody to do, including my architectural clients and my general contractor clients. Right. I mean, general contractors have it hard. I mean, I'm not s sympathizing with them completely, but they have to do what are called hard bids and they have to have three top bids in commercial jobs. And if it, strays from that bid that they choose to get the job they have to inform it's called a change order that's what i propose to my designers i call it an ad service or just additional scope send a letter to your client and say this was outside the original estimate here's what you told me you wanted and that's not what we talked about originally and i want to let you know it'll cost maybe blah 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 in addition to what we already talked about and it's just a polite discussion with them it doesn't have to be emotional. Actually, you want to take the emotion out of it, but you want to have a kind tone a little bit. And believe it or not, the client may come back and go, oh, you're absolutely right. That is an addition. Oh, I completely understand why you're charging me more. And I want to not do it knowing that. Right. Like, give them the knowledge, respect their time, respect the client's money. They will allow you I mean they will thank you for it and the ones that freak out when you do stuff like that we should probably reconsider maybe I don't want to say fire them but you should probably reconsider working with people like that going forward because they're so on adrenaline and emotion and there's a lot of that these days so we need to make sure we onboard them and detect that type of I guess I could call it spazzing out at the beginning as opposed to the middle when you're owed 50 grand for mm. certain time billings and product. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I love this, yeah. you know, additional scope letter because it is so true. And, you know, to me, what I always, the way I call it is, you know, don't decide how to spend your client's money. If they are asking you or describing to you something that you know is out of scope don't assume they don't know it's out of scope. That's my point. A lot of times a, a designer will knee jerk and say, now they're asking me to do this and it's not part of what I already charged them for. And so they want me to do it, you know, for free. And I, I know I've pushed designers back and said, well, do you really know that they expect it for free? I mean, maybe they're no. just, it's no different than, I always use the restaurant analogies. If I'm sitting there and I ordered a piece of chocolate cake after I had this lovely dinner and you bring me my bill and I say, you know, I want another piece of chocolate cake. You're going to pull the bill away. You're going to bring me another piece of chocolate cake and you're going to put the new bill down. I get it. I, just because you <laughs> already gave me a bill, I'm a grown up. I know I want more chocolate cake. I expect to pay for it. And and I yes. don't think that we realize enough in this industry that that is always a possibility of what's happening in our client's mind. And to your point, when you present it neutrally, politely, as a matter of fact, I call it easy breezy. When the clients that I'm working with, they'll know that that's my language. It's like, oh, okay, so you wanted us to completely knock down the fireplace now. That's great. We didn't talk about that in the original scope. Here's the invoice for 10 grand. And to your point, the client could go, oh, yeah, I didn't think it would cost 10000 I thought it would be nothing, or I thought it would be 1000 or I thought, okay, well, it is ten. Do you still want it? No, never mind. Or yes, okay. So I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. But get me back to building this estimate. So we're going to sit down. Let's, let's imagine we are relatively new in business, or even if we're 10 years in business, but we've never done the exercise. We've never done this pre-work. We've always kind of built it as we're running along and throwing numbers at people and hoping they just keep um, buying, you know, sending checks, right? So mm -hmm. what is, when you're working, I'd actually rather take it from that standpoint, from a person, from a standpoint of a designer that has been in business 10, 15 years and you start working with them and you find that they're like, this is it. I am done 
with this business being this big, scary yarn ball to me. I, I want to understand it. Yeah. I know how to design all day long. I know how to manage my clients as far as a personal relationship, a professional relationship. I got that locked down, but I'm sick and tired of the business back end being this yarn ball. So how do you teach them to pull back and retrain and go in and start to do and build these estimates? Well, that's a great question. And I'm not trying to sell myself, but you can hire me to help you walk you through it. Um, Doing this for 20 years and learning the construction trade and uh, being on job trailers and doing all that by hand. But what I would do is uh, ask you if you want to do it on your own, you sit with a piece of paper or you open Excel, whatever you're comfortable with. Not all of us learned Excel in school. And believe it or not, I've taken refresher courses because I'm not going to say how long ago I learned Excel. Um, It was a very long time ago. And you sit there and you, you list your rooms. You list, like I said earlier, you list at the top of your piece of paper, design hours, and then you list purchasing slash installation. And then you sit there. If the word living room is there, you say, okay, what did my client on our walkthrough say she wanted in the living room? And you start writing down lamp, chair, sofa. Ooh, area rug. She really liked that. This means, guess what, everyone? We're going to have to take really good notes during our walkthrough or going through, if it's a new build, going through the the, the uh, plans. Um, you sit there and you list out your furniture in the living room and you put through all your notes, go through your notes with the client. And yeah, this sounds lengthy. I know some of you are rolling your eyes at this process, but this is what it takes. Slow down. Shut your door. Don't let anyone in for an hour. Write it down and then say, based off your personal experience, how long does it take to design a living room? And write down your first thing that comes to your head. Like, oh, well, last time it took me 20 hours and I'm going to go to my database and check real quick with my past projects. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe 25 to 30 hours, you know, and then the purchasing and installation is probably a bigger range to let's be honest, everybody going through a pandemic, things are constantly being shut down and reopened. So you need to prepare your clients. I'm going to make this pandemic friendly, this explanation. You need to allow for change in schedule and say it could be, you need, and to do that, you can have a bigger range on your purchasing and installation. Okay, so I just as a caution, I've heard from designers that normally if someone wants something installed by Christmas, they have to order it in September. It's been that way for years until this year. Manufacturers are behind and everyone's having to order now to get it by Christmas. I mean, it's just the word on the street. So knowing things like that, like constantly reading blogs and talking to vendors and keeping up your relationships, that's how you're going to be able to do your estimate. So you write down, okay, normally my this purchasing and installation thing would take only 20 hours to 30. Well, now it could be 20 to 60. And a lot of my clients are like, well, what do I tell the client when they, they say, why is that range so big? You will know how to answer that question because you did an estimate. You ask yourself that same question in your head. So they're just asking that question. So you should have an answer for that. Also, you guys, protect your staff, protect your client's property, and that shows a lot of respect, so you need to make sure you're telling them how you're protecting them and their home and your own staff, okay? This is a brave new world we're in right now. Right. Um, So I want to make sure that in your purchasing and, and installation hours, you have a bigger range, which you probably will. And on this topic, a lot of my clients, because of the purchasing and installation uncertainty, they've been doing that hourly when normally they would do it lump sum. And so to believe it or not, design hours could be a lump sum, but purchasing and installation could be hourly because it's more cost effective to your client to pay it hourly instead of lump sum because they could end up overpaying. And we just can't predict it. We haven't been in a pandemic since what? The early 1900s? Right. Was that what the flu or something was <laughs> what we dealt with? Anyway, they didn't have interior design back then. Well, they did, but it wasn't too pretty. But anyway. <laughs> 
So, okay. So the idea is that we go back to those four categories, design fee, purchasing fee, installation fee, and the furniture into, into our now tour furniture fee. And we put them on a spreadsheet and we list it by room and we just go through and we do this. And if we have data, we go back to the data and say, the last four living rooms I did, it took me anywhere from 18 to 22 hours. So that's a pretty good, you know, 18 to 22 hours, four, four out of four rooms, I can put down 22 hours. Like I'm going to go to the high part myself. Right. And mm-hmm. then, but mm-hmm. if I don't have data, this is where this breaks down. And this is why it's so important to track our time. Even if we are in business 10, 15 and 20 years, if we've never done it by data, we've always done it by feel, then And there are designers that do it by feel. I absolutely know there are. But this is where the profitability Mm -hmm. gets compromised when we do things by – because I've had conversations where – um, I think I've used the example once before, uh, a designer and I were working together and we were trying to come up with the design hours that uh, she expected to do on a particular project. And it was it was important that she do this because it was also a project that was out of state and there were lots of other little nudgy expenses that were going to come in. So I was very... Um, you know, emphatic about let's get the design part at least as finite as we possibly can because when other unexpected expenses come in because it's out of state, we don't want the whole profitability to go out the door. And it was interesting because in the one room, she she was explaining, oh, the only thing we really need in this room is a window treatment because she was doing some rooms completely over and other rooms refreshing for the client. And she's, and I said, oh, okay, how many hours did you put down for that? I have three. And, and you see, I sell window treatments for a living. (laughs) And so it was a really good exercise because as I started to describe everything that she is going to do in order to, uh, actually design, order, and install, not personally, but oversee the delivery of that window treatment, we were at a minimum of nine hours. And of course, it was interesting to me and to her, because if we had picked a different room to start with, and it was, say it was a master bedroom, and she said 35 hours, I wouldn't have had that direct knowledge to know that that was unreasonable. But the point was that I knew it was unreasonable to think that it would take three hours to design the window treatments for this space. And so with that information, we went back. And ultimately, it was probably about 50% more hours that needed to be included in the design estimate portion. And that's a huge, basically, that's your profit right there. If you leave off 50% of your hours, there goes your profit right out the window. And this is why we're in business 10 and 15 and 20 years. And we're saying, I'm a really talented designer. How come there's never any money in my checkbook when I'm done at the (laughs) end of the year? Right? Because it's the guessing. It's the guessing instead of the getting the finite. And, you know, I have to go back to your example of the way you prepare for a big test. We don't just walk in. If you have a, if you yourself have a a husband or a wife or a friend or a child that's ever sat for a bar exam or the medical, you know, uh, boards, you know, that's a huge, huge investment up until that point in time, money, education. And when it comes time to sit for it, you just don't say, well, I guess everything I've ever done so far will just come into play and it'll all be fine on that morning of the test. And that's sort of like having the false security of having 10 or 15 years experience as a designer and thinking, hey, I'm going to put this estimate together in an hour because I know what I'm doing, right? It's that same Mm -hmm. thing. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, that's why I got C's in English. I would just walk in and, hey, I'm like, it's only writing. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, my goodness. So, all right. And then... So once we do this, I got I know that we've had other de, the, some of the, the more seasoned designers on the f- show over the years tell us that once they do this exercise, then they keep the records. And so you're not mm-hmm. building it from scratch each time. You're saying, okay, a kitchen 10 by 20, you know, X amount of projects, X amount of hours. And now you're pulling that. You Like to me, I'm visualizing it as 
the individual detailed spreadsheets for the individual projects, but then maybe I would have eventually develop a master spreadsheet that says the average of these 10 projects, master bedrooms were this many hours. The average of these 10 projects, powder baths were this many hours. Is that like, that's just a logical step that goes to my brain. Is that, is that something that it's done? Yeah, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up as well, because what we want to do is I always say do a mid project check against the estimate Mm. or a quarter. And some of those I, you know, bring to light additional scope that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. So it's two point. You're you might find additional scope and go back to your client mid project. And actually, I would prefer doing it three to four times throughout the project, Mm. especially for the bigger ones, the smaller ones, not so much. I mean, those are over maybe in a a month, but we need to make sure that if we're far off from the estimate, we have it on record again, keep good records. And again, I'm going to bring this up, track your time, everybody. I mean, um, that, that when somebody asks me a question at the end of the, the conversations always track your time. So, um, you need to make sure you are recording over unders throughout the project, especially the two to three year ones for those larger design projects. Yes, I agree. And I have to say, it is tedious to track your time, but you have, you know, if you're using my Doma Studio, there's a time tracker built in, there's apps that you can use to track your time, whatever it is. The point is, though, that that is your knowledge. That, and, and if you think about it as this is one of the huge factors in your profitability. And if you were to just say, at the end of the year, would you give me, would, would you take, would you say, if somebody said to you, I'll give you $25,000 if you track your time this year, we'd all go, well, yes. Well, that's what happens yeah. when you track your time, right? You, you earn more money because you don't loosey goosey it and leave billable hours off the table, right? Yeah. And I actually have specific clients I work with that give bonuses directly related to time tracking and profitability and production rates. So if they put like 40 hours a week and 20% of it is tracked as being invoiced versus where their target of 40, they don't get their bonus. Like it's directly related to production rates and time tracking. That's an excellent idea. And I'm going to tell you what, if I were (laughs) the principal of a firm with several designers under me, I love that idea. But I'm going to tell you what, I would do it if I was a solo. I would say if my goal is to be billable 40% of the week, 60% of the week, whatever it is, I would literally, maybe I do it once a quarter. I do the analyzation and every time I finish a quarter on goal, I would take a bonus. I would take a prize. I would take a, I would do something. I don't care if the only thing I could afford was an extra massage that month or if the bonus was a thousand (laughs) dollar shopping spree at the mall, whatever rocked my boat, I would do it Yeah, because that's a mode. I love that. And especially motivating for employees and especially motivating for employees that you see the potential in as being ones who will you will raise up through your firm into management levels to teach them when they are the baby designer how important time tracking is and how it relates to profitability this way when they're you know raised up to junior designer senior designer project manager whatever it is it's not just oh now that you're in the big leagues up here at this level of my firm you got to pay attention like you train them up from the beginning on both yes. your your aesthetic and your style but how you run your business. I love that. Yeah. I, yeah. And I actually, the people not on the not so great side when they don't track their time and you've repeatedly told them to, and they get written up because, and then they end up, some of my clients have me talk to them and we all know out there in, in podcast land that I am blunt. I Mm -hmm. am to the point I'm billed by the hour and I don't have time for chit chat. So when they get on with me, 
um, my my soccer kids call it my angry Sicilian face. Um, <laughs> they are like, oh my God, who was that woman? She just scared me or I really have to track my time. So that's kind of the final straw that some of my clients use. And some of my clients call me the closer, but <laughs> I then if they're still not doing it, they some have been laid off. Right. I have to be honest. It's, it's not a nice thing to do, but you guys, tracking your time is directly proportionate to making a profit like I have proved anyone that's disagreed with me I proved them wrong just because tracking your time makes money right it you know it's just plain and plain and simple well it it is to me but I know it is it's a hundred percent everybody else Yeah. yeah We, I mean, we've done this exercise a dozen times on the podcast. Claire Jefford, my good friend, co-author in the second book, she was at, she came from Canada to Window Works for a lunch and learn, and she ran the lunch and learn. And she did an exercise with us, and she said, let's just say you bill 125 an hour. This is not unreasonable. Probably 50% of the firms in the country are billing around that rate. We've got the luxury ones that are four, five, and 600. We've got the mid-level, uh, upper level, um, you know, firms that are building billing 200 to 375. Then we have our, our brand new baby designers that are building, billing under 100. But 125 is not pie in the sky, unreachable. And she did an exercise with us where she just said, let's just say you either every week you come up with your billable hours for your client and it comes up to 10 and you think, think to yourself, mm, I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should say it's seven or you haven't tracked your hours and you call it 10 and it was really 13, right? So she said 125 a week times three hours is 375 times if you do 375, let's times 50 weeks, figuring you take two weeks off a year, that's $18,750. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, what is that? That's, that's, that's somebody's part of a, a half a salary for a senior designer in your firm. That's probably the whole salary for a bookkeeper. That's probably the whole mm-hmm. salary for a part-time virtual VA that manages your email marketing. I mean, here's what it is. It's also $19,000 that you could have gone to Europe for two weeks on. Like, let's be serious. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. and that's, um, it's one twenty five yeah. an hour for only three hours a week. You start to mm-hmm. mu- multiply mm-hmm. that if you're making two fifty, two seventy five. You start to multiply that if you're doing five or six hours a week that you're losing because you're either not having the nerve. And what does it say? When you don't have the nerve to build the full 10 hours, why is that? It's because you didn't track it and you guessed it anyway. If you build, if you tracked mm-hmm. it and it was 10, I think you're in a lot better position to put the word, the number 10 there, right? Mm-hmm. And the number of my clients will be like, well, I'm getting pushback on my time billings. And I said, okay, well, did you do an estimate and ex- and understand why it's so big at this given time? No, I I really couldn't, you know, I just felt uncomfortable explaining it to the client. I'm like, okay, there's that didn't study for the test thing mm-hmm. that's popping up in my mind. And I say, well, you need to be able to explain your bills. It's every right for the client to, to ask questions about especially large bills. But you go back and you explain to them where their money's going and you have that confidence. That all comes from the estimate. That right. all of it comes from the estimate. So halfway through the job, they're like, oh, your time billing for the month is 20 grand. I'm not sure what this bill means here and there and here. And if you go back through and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is confusing. It's a learning process. You can be like, OK, I need to better educate my staff. I'm putting their time in mm-hmm. or do a better job at editing. Like things come to light if we don't have cross checks like that. Right. Right, but exactly. it, it all comes down to putting your time in one every single day. I always tell my clients 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the day should be dedicated to putting in your time in whatever software you're using. Yes, I agree. You and, know, the, and your that, point is well, think profit. Right, right, right. And your point's well made. If you have given a client a time, you know, an estimate on design fees, whether you tell them how many hours it is or not, whatever it is, however your process is, but if it's rooted in realness, right? So you said, if we're going to say that figuring out a window treatment is nine hours and we're going to decide nine hours, well, 
if you all, all now you say, oh, the design fee for the window treatment, instead of being $900, is going to be $2,000, and they say, what's that about? You can say, well, remember, in the original estimate for the window treatment, it included one revision. It included two revisions, one revision on the style, two revisions on fabric. Do you remember last week when we reviewed the 15th style? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, in other words, to your point is... When you know where the estimate number came from, when you are different and someone pushes you back, you have the answer for why it's different, right? That's really the, yes. the thing. Uh-huh. And and to your other point, every single person as a consumer, it is not, not, it is not, they're not being mean. They're not being rude. They're not being unreasonable if they simply say, how did you arrive at this $22,000 figure for design fees? Like, just tell it to mm-hmm. me, right? Because like you yeah. said, mm-hmm. if you if you did arrive at it, you did arrive at it, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, and all right. I, I just want to make a comment on the 15th revision. That's an issue of a bigger problem. But that's a good example. But, yeah, hopefully if, if your original estimate already – only included three provisions, everybody. If you're on your 15th, you should have told them that ahead of time <laughs> yes, exactly. through that ad service process. But I'm just saying, holy cow, 15 revisions. Right. Ooh. No, but that's the point. It's like, and I love that yeah. to make to make that clarification. We wouldn't present that at the end. We would say, okay, oh. um, we've done our, our revisions that are included. Here is your, this is the ad service letter that you described. Just wanted to send this mm. to you. We're working on our fourth revision. Two revisions were included. Here's the add-on for the hours on this. So what happens is when we take the time to do this homework ahead of time and to really um, track our hours, I love doing it on a daily basis because, I mean, I don't remember what I did yesterday, let alone five days ago. So to say that to me that, oh, I sit down on Friday and I review my week and I track it, uh uh-uh, I'm sorry. That's like I'm going to count my calories and just put them all in on Friday. Stop. You know what I'm (laughs) saying? Like, no. And so, so I love that, the daily tracking. I love the creation of the Excel spreadsheets with the detail and to archiving that information so that we have it for future. And to your point earlier about Sarah, that's probably exactly the case. Sarah can go to an archive of detailed reports and she can say, you know what? When I really put all this data into one big lump sum and I divide it by a square footage fee, it sort of comes out to this nine times out of ten. She's still going to do her actual estimating for each project. As you said, we're both sure Mm -hmm. of that. But if she just in a high-level meeting wants to throw a number out, she's throwing a number out based on her past work experience, right? And and that's a goal. She's so successful, too. Yeah. I mean, because she does the tracking she does. Right. That's why she's good at what she does. Right. And don't be afraid if you are new in the business to say, um, I need to do a walkthrough and then discuss schedule with you. And then I need to run some numbers and I'll get back to you. Absolutely. You need to, you know, don't be afraid to say that. A lot of times I tell my clients to throw me under the bus and say, my CFO and I are going to run the numbers and put just a rough estimate together because every project's different. Right. And you know, that shows respect for that client's money and their time. Right. So right. yeah. You know what it is? I literally just had this at window works just the other day, literally a, a woman called, I happened to answer the phone. She wanted to um, make an appointment for an estimate on a, a patio awning. And she found us from the newcomers club on Facebook. Yay. Love that group. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, We get to chatting and she said, well, I have a pergola structure and I don't know if I need a retractable awning on the house or is there a way that you could put like a retractable structure on my existing pergola? And I said, of course there is. We absolutely can do either one of those things, blah, blah, blah. And so we're chit-chatting. I make the appointment for her and all of a sudden she says to me, you know, I don't really have any idea how much something like this would cost. And This is exactly that moment. This is a casual conversation. This moment is not designed for giving a price. I have not been to the house. I have no idea what size it is. And she's mentioned two different, very different types of structures that we could possibly provide her with. But the thing is, what I know is that there isn't an awning on the planet that's going to cost $1,000, you see? So I Mm -hmm. say to her, I say to her, 
So uh, you know what? Of course, it's going to depend on the size of the awning, the the bells and whistles you want, whether you do the pergola cover or you do the retractable, whatever it is. But I can tell you that most projects that we do are going to start around five to eight and they can go to 25 to 30,000. And you see... That is a really absurd range on one hand. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a range that she can go back to her budget and work with. But she now knows if she's called a competitor and they've said, oh, this is $800. No, this is not $800, right? Because I'm not delivering that sort of a product. Or she now knows to say to herself, huh. This is significant. And I think as a consumer, because mm-hmm. I could have just stuck to my guns and said, I don't have any idea what the size is. I don't have any, because I really don't know if it's going to be a 5,000 or a 35,000. But the point is, mm-hmm. she just was ha- glad to know that we were being real with, it's not a 1,000. I think that's what it is, mm-hmm. right? So designing a master bedroom, yeah. it's, if designing a master bedroom with all the bells and whistles and everything is 50K, then you look at me and say, typically anywhere from, you know, 40 to 60 K. And I know, okay, this isn't $5,000 at Pottery Barn, right? I just, but we're going to get together. We're going to have a walkthrough. We're going to really get as finite on your thing. But as consumers who are new to the game, we don't have any idea. That's the point. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. can't make that guess is my point without your data. And I've looked at, you know, 35 years, 37 years of awning invoices to know. <laughs> Not many of them come across my guess that are 500 or $1,000 is the point. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And actually doing through estimates for as long as I've done, um, I'll look at a square footage of a house and, and then look at their budget that my, that my designers come to me with. They're like, oh, they want to do 15,000 square feet for a million. I'm like, ah, that's hilarious. <laughs> like, I'll say that to my, to my designer client and they'll kind of be like, how did you know you're not a designer? I'm like, no, I know numbers right, and I right. know how, you know, the, I've looked at them every single day for 20 years. So I do it based off experience. I don't have to be a designer to know that number is absurd. But, I mean, they could probably do it if they bought everything from Ikea. Right. right. Ikea, sorry. (laughs) I hope they're not a sponsor of yours. No. Okay, good. I just screwed the pooch on that one. Yeah, I wouldn't let you get away with it if they're a sponsor. You know that. (laughs) I know, right? Yeah. So No, that's the truth. It's that body of experience. You've you've worked so closely with so many designers for so many years, reviewing the budgets, taking in the numbers, and it's that same thing. It's just knowing what's reasonable, not what's finite, what's exactly specific to this project, but what is a reasonable range. And I think as professionals, it's our responsibility to sort of understand what's a reasonable range for those very early conversations where Mm -hmm. someone is just deciding, do they want to even take the step to the actual discovery call, which leads to the consultation? right Mm -hmm. yeah and actually to bring up your your high-end client and just when they have a lot of employees um i have this one client that i work with that we look at the the variances between the estimate and the actuals every other month and so six times a year i gather data for 45 projects for this one client and they make decisions on their staffing on their bonuses, on a lot of stuff just based off this analysis. So this drives, like, the the data drives your entire company's structure sometimes if you if you make it you know but you can make logical decisions based off actual numbers and i think that's important to point out because there were like i tell all my clients you're not in the business of just being a designer you're an entrepreneur you need to be as good with your numbers as i am like I'm not a designer, but I knew for a fact you couldn't have a budget of a million for fifteen thousand square feet. You know, it's you gotta you've gotta learn all the aspects of running a company, and this is just a very important one. Exactly, I love it. I love it. I love it so good. So, um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I um, it is daunting, especially if you haven't done it. Whether you're in business one year or twenty years, it's daunting to go back and do this. But it is so well mm-hmm. worth it, and the confidence mm-hmm. that you get. Right? Do you see the confidence grow in your clients, Kim, as they master this and get? 
get real and just, you know, just decide that's it. I'm going to do it. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to um, just put a shout out to Kimberly Harrison in California because she introduced me to your podcast a year, I think two years ago, and she does estimates like clockwork now. And I'm so proud of her. So shout out to Kimberly. Isn't yeah, she's that... got a really cool name too. So Oh, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, Kimberly, for turning this Kimberly onto the show because, of course, we've benefited. <laughs> You've been on the show two other times at this point. We'll put those episodes in the show notes, of course. And I look forward to our book launch in November 2020. Yeah. Yes. And so, and then, of course, Luann Live in February 2021 had to be delayed because of COVID, but we're regrouping, revising, and coming out even better. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay. I want to make sure everyone stays safe out there. Please just wear your masks. Absolutely. Good advice. On top of the financial advice, we get a little health advice. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Thanks, Kim, for coming on again. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you for having me. So I know you know that when we started our business, there were no computers, there was no Excel, we didn't have the tools and the technology that we all have available now, right? But even then, even when when we were using spreadsheets and paper and pen, we knew that without a firm grasp on numbers, we were going to be in trouble. Matter of fact, forget trouble. We're just going to be spinning our wheels, right? So, of course, this is in part because of my husband. I'm not in part. Let's be serious. And it's an all because of him, right? Because he obsessed. He's obsessed about making sure every dollar is accounted for. And it is this commitment to knowing and understanding the numbers that is, is and was a huge factor in our success at Window Works. So whether it's window treatments, it's interior design, it's website development, whatever it is, getting clear and knowing and understanding where you're spending your time and what you're charging for is the way to make sure that every moment and every dollar counts, right? Because data drives your company. It directly steers profitability. And if you're not using data, you are just relying on your gut instinct or feeling, then you're probably leaving money on the table. Now, I mentioned Claire Jefford, my co-author in the second book, and of course, big time interior design business coach in the industry. So great, right? Um, I always talk about this story when she came to Window Works a couple of years ago for a lunch and learn. And I remember she went through the exercise. She said, for example, if you bill at $125 an hour, and in a particular week, you spent 13 hours on a project, but you only sent the bill for 10 hours because either you were afraid of the client's reaction, you didn't have the confidence to send the amount of hours that you really build or because you didn't really track it. You really didn't know that you did 13 hours and you just kind of said, well, it must have been about 10, right? The thing is, when you take that out, that measly three hours a week, when you take that out and put it across 50 weeks, do you know that it adds up to $18,750 that you left on the table? Think about that. $18,750 if every week for 50 weeks you underbill by just three hours, either because you didn't track it or you didn't have the confidence to send the bill for the amount of hours you actually worked. All right. So the thing is, at the end of the day, you're just like Kim says, you're not just a designer, you're a business person, you're an entrepreneur. Okay, you are here to help people have beautiful homes. There's no question. But if you're here and you're listening to my show, then it's probably not a hobby, right? You're not doing it for free. So look in the mirror and really, really get serious with your numbers. Okay, because once you become trained and ingrained with this process, it will become second nature to you and it's not going to be a drag. Okay, remember Lisa Gilmore? She's like so excited now for Finance Fridays. Okay, so and also Sarah Magnus, great advice in her episode. Go listen to that 384. Okay, I talked about a little bit that in the show as well. All right, so but you gotta. 
put the work in. All right. So whether you're a rising designer or you've been in business for a hundred years, a seasoned designer, if you are not doing this, you're missing out. You're costing yourself profitability. All right. Because if you're not tracking your time, you're not educating yourself on every aspect of the scope and getting very clear about how long it takes you. Okay. You're not going to be able to do things with clarity and you're going to cost yourself money. It's as simple as that. All right. So I have a goodie for you today. I was so impressed by what Kimberly had to say and everything that she brought to the table that we created a goodie for you, all right? So uh, she came in and she presented this big idea, and that's going to be a change for some of you running your business this way. So we want to make sure that it is as doable as possible, okay? So we have a tip sheet with big takeaways and some of the reminders for practical ways to make this work. All right. You can go to luannnigara.com forward slash goodies. All right. And of course, if you've already signed up for the goodies page, you don't have to sign up again. You can just go there and sign into your portal and get it. All right. Now, I can't overstate enough the importance of what Kim is saying. She points it out. Time tracking is directly related to how much money you make. And time tracking is available in my Doma studio. Okay, so you can get their complete interior design toolkit, which is designed to help you organize design projects from beginning to end, including the time tracking tool. All right, you can keep uh, track of your time, of the employees that work for you, both the billable and the non billable time. Okay, so sign up for your free trial at mydomastudio.com forward slash a well designed business. All right, so we were talking about the book quite a bit here, all right? Um, it's coming out November, and we are going to have a huge book launch event. It's going to be a free live virtual event, and you will get to a chance to connect with Kimberly and all of the other experts in the new Power Talk Friday book. Okay, so please listen up for announcements on how to sign up for that. And of course, that's going to be followed up by Luann Live 2021. It's officially a go, right? Okay, I know that we missed it in 2020 because of COVID, um, but 2021, we're doing it in the first big part of the year, February. Okay. So to make sure you are on the list, go to luannlive.com. That's where you'll get the email as soon as registration opens. All right. So I hope you will take today's episode to heart as a wake up call if you need to be more focused on the money side of your business. Okay. Um, you need to be more than a designer. You, you know, you need to be the business person too. All right. So thank you so much for listening today. I really do appreciate that you show up. I just love it. I love it a lot. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one -on -one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.